What do you think of music today? Big Backstreet Boys fan? <laughs> if you need I, I more like time, it. I like I could... it more when the groups actually play something. <laughs> He was born in Gainesville, Florida, and he got into music. He met Elvis when he was a youth. He was doing like some sort of tour across something for a movie, maybe. And yeah, uh, Petty went and met him and thought it was cool. He was a rock star. He started a band called Mud Crutch. They named it after uh, one of their buddies' farms was called Mud Crutch or something, so they named it after that. He moved to Los Angeles with Mud Crutch and got a record deal for their first album. They put it out, and it did terrible. So then they broke up, and some of the guys from Mud Crutch became the heartbreakers. But yeah, so then the Mud Crutch guys, they disbanded, and then he got... Um, Two guys. One was Mike Campbell, who played guitar, and then a guy named Ben Mont Tinch, who was on the keyboard uh, from Mud Crutch to join the Heartbreakers. Or not join, I guess, start the Heartbreakers. And then they had two other guys a guy called Ron Blair and a guy called Stan Lanch. Um, and they started the Heartbreakers in 1976. Just tell us a little bit about the band, like how it formed, etc. We wanted to do the same thing, which was play an A chord. So we formed the band immediately. And the A chord sounded so good that we made the band, right? That's right. <laughs> hold on, hold on. Ron, can you seriously tell us how the band got together? <laughs> um, well, that was about Seriously. it. That was the yeah. truth. Yeah, yeah, that's all the truth. But yeah, they released their debut album, which was self self-titled album. There's a couple of good songs on it, Breakdown and American Girl, but they didn't really do very good in America. Somehow their song got the album got popular in the United Kingdom, so they went back and re-released <coughs> re their single, Breakdown, and it got to number 40 on the American charts. American Girl from that album, which is like one of their... I'm pretty sure they played it at the Super Bowl halftime show. It never even made it onto the charts until it's re-released two decades later. Wow, it's a hit. Yeah, I know, it's just kind of crazy the way those things worked out. So they put out, 20 years after that, they put out a, a Greatest Hits, and that's when it made it on the charts. Um, then they put out You're Gonna Get It was their next album, which went to 23 on the, on the charts. And his record label, Shelter, at the time, was bought by MCA and... Around this time, so he'd put out two albums. He got into a legal clash, I guess, with MCA negotiating his contract and ended up going bankrupt. Kind of left a bitter taste in his mouth for record labels, and as you'll kind of hear throughout, he's constantly going back and forth with, with these people. and is never very happy with them. It's kind of what took out John Fogarty for a decade. Clashing with the record label? Well, yeah. He just got his songs back, actually, I think just this year. What was that guy's name? The Saul Zance. Saul Zance. Yeah. The record guy, yeah. Then he, he basically kept all the money credence earned, wouldn't renegotiate after they got big, you know. Mm -hmm. And then he started a big filmmaking career or whatever, you know, finance a bunch of movies and stuff. And also, he's known for the the hit song, Zance Can't Dance. Oh, yeah. But he'll steal your money. <laughs> yeah, Petty had a couple songs about... There's one called Joe that's kind of about some big shot record label guy.
Seems like a theme back then. Yeah. Pink, Pink Floyd, have a cigar. And then we're dying of a Yeah, so now he's working for MCA, and he signed with a, I guess it'd be a subsidiary of MCA called Backstreet Records, and they released the album Damn the Torpedoes. This is 1979 now, and that made it up to number two on the charts. A couple good songs on that album, Don't Do Me Like That and um, Refugee. Oh, yeah. It's got so many hits. Yeah, they're all, I mean, every single album's got like at least one or two good ones. So then after they put out Damn the Torpedoes, um, which made it to number two, MCA was going to raise the price of their next album. Like the standard at the time was eight ninety eight for an album, and they were going to raise it to nine ninety eight. And uh, Tom Petty thought that was bogus. So he got into a like an old standoff with MCA, and he threatened that if they're going to raise the cost of the album he wasn't going to release the tracks to him or he would name the album 898 in mm. protest but eventually MCA backed down and it was called Hard Promises this is 1981 it had their first number one, number one single The Waiting In that same year, he was busy in 1981. He hooked up with Stevie Nicks and did Stop Dragging My Heart Around. 1982, they put out Long After Dark uh, with the single You Got Lucky, another great song. It's just like every album, they got multiple multiple hits but after that album was out the tension started to rise a little with the heartbreakers ron blair left and they replaced him by a guy by the name of howie epstein epstein or epstein i don't know not to be confused with the other epstein in the news no relation <laughs> well there may be I don't know, but. so yeah after howie epstein joined they wanted to change their sound a little bit and they brought in a bunch of different guys to help produce the next album and like a bunch of different producers, but then they also brought in a bunch of various singers and musicians and things. Uh, one guy who was producing it was Robbie Robertson of the band. Mm. At the, over the course of making that album, though, Petty, the frustrations got so high with trying to manage, said managing all the different personalities and things that he punched a hole in the wall in the recording studio and broke his hand. <laughs> He was a little bit of a different guy. From what I understand, he really didn't have hobbies. He just made music and liked touring. And He said something to the effect of, I have friends who go to Hawaii or play golf for fun. This is what I do for fun. So that's just all he ever wanted to do. Do you know any of the albums at all very well? No, that Damn the Torpedoes sounded familiar. Full Moon full moon, Fever. Full Moon Fever. Yeah. Uh, well, the next album was Southern Accents, which is like kind of a... I feel like the pace of it slows down a little bit, which is just kind of interesting. He was so f frustrated about everything, but it's kind of a softer, and it's a little bit, I mean, it's kind of weird, like probably his weirdest song, Don't Come Around Here No More, is like one of the kind of more different sounding songs. Mm -hmm. When you hear it, it doesn't sound like a, any other song that you can put your finger on. But Don't come around here no more. The whole album is just kind of a, a little bit of a different sound than what he had been doing, which is, I guess, what he was shooting for. Rebels is another good one from that album. In Southern Accents, which Johnny Cash would later cover. But in 1986, they toured with Bob Dylan. And uh, so Petty got to be friends with Bob Dylan. So after they toured with Dylan, he went back to the studio and they recorded Let Me Up, I've Had Enough. 
not their best album in the world, but there was one decent song on it, Jammin' Me. That was 86. In 88, he joined up. He joined a super group, kind of like LeBron did. Not two, not three, not four, not five, not six, not seven. (laughs) It's called the Traveling Wilburys. You ever heard of them? No. It's got George Harrison, Bob Dylan, Jeff Lynne, and Roy Orbison, and Tom Petty, of course. Wow. Their songs, to me, there's not that many like good ones that you would. Those super groups never really seem to put out music that would yeah. kind of, you know, live up to the hype of the names in them. But there's a couple good ones. But the album went triple platinum and actually won a Grammy, so it wasn't like a failure. But yeah, so then he went solo in 1989. The first solo album was Full Moon Fever, and that was produced by Jeff Lynne. But he also had several of the Heartbreakers on there. Almost wasn't released. What? So when he took, he said he never had really even a comment on any of his albums by the uh, record heads or whatever. He took it in and they said it's not going to be any good. So they weren't going to release it. And uh, he said, this is a quote from him. I said, I'm not buying this. There's nothing wrong. I really like this record. And then I waited a while until the top regime at the record company changed. And I came back and I played them the same record and they were overjoyed. It turned out to be a huge hit. <laughs> That's wild. I mean, you've been so successful up to that point that you questioned the artist. Yeah, well, it was his first solo album, but That's yeah, it's true. just kind of kind of funny that he, he had never even really gotten a comment on any of his other music. Like, they never tried to cancel anything and they're like, this one's not going to be any good. Sorry, Tom it's, Petty. This isn't very good. <laughs> it's probably his biggest album. I'd say. Here's here's side one. is free falling. I won't back down. Love is a long road of facing the crowd and running down a dream. Wow. That's crazy. <laughs> uh, but yeah, at the end of running down a dream, he put on this little interlude. I've never heard it like on another song. I've never really heard anything like it, but it's like a bunch of barn noises in the background. And then it's Tom comes on and says, Hello, CD listeners. We've come to the point in this album where those listening on cassette or records will have to stand up or sit down and turn over the record or tape. In fairness to those listeners, we'll now take a few seconds before we begin side two. Thank you. Here's side two. It's kind of interesting. I've not really heard that before. but Yeah, so then he went back with the Traveling Wilburys for their second album that they titled Volume 3. I, you know, I don't know that it was... There's really nothing of note on it, I don't think. But, uh, the Heartbreakers put out Into the Great Wide Open after that. Into the Great Wide Open Under the skies of blue Out in the Great Wide Open A rebel without a clue One thing I always thought was like he he was with the heartbreakers and then he went solo and then he didn't like then he just had a solo career but after he went solo he would put out a solo album and then he'd go back to the heart put out a heartbreakers album then he'd put out a solo album which is just seems kind of different but. so what was the difference different record company or i mean if um, some of the members overlapped just not all of them i don't know i think it was just he wanted like full control but yeah he didn't have i know the a lot of the heartbreakers helped with all of them yeah i don't think he did one i don't think he did one without any of the heartbreakers like contributing some but i know wildflowers was a solo album and he later said it's the best album that we ever did talking about like me and the heartbreakers even though it's a solo album but yeah i don't really know i don't know why he did that but i know he joined up with uh rick rubin Whoa. so i don't know if it's just the producer was different or what but because on jeff lynn produced uh the first one full moon fever and i think rick rubin produced his next two solo ones so but also the heartbreakers weren't on every single song they just came in for little 
pieces here or there. But yeah, he put out Into the Great Wide Open with the Heartbreakers. Learning to Fly was on that album, another good one. Around that time, he announced he signed a deal with Warner Brothers and he'd be leaving MCA kind of suddenly. Um, before he left, they put out a Greatest Hits album. This is 1993, and it featured Mary Jane's Last Dance for the first time, and he worked with Rick Rubin on that she one. Grew up in an Indiana town, had a good looking mom. She never was around, but she grew up tall and she grew up right with the Indiana boys on an Indiana night. And that album would be on the charts for six years straight. Wow. And that's where uh, American Girl first got on to. First Warner Brother album that he did, and he had Ruben join him, was uh, Wildflowers, which was his solo. That's got a couple. It's a different sounding album, too. Uh, and there's a documentary about the making of the album on Hulu or Netflix or one of those streaming sites that's pretty good. It's got like some footage of, I don't know, someone had a video camera or something they were recording, just some kind of behind the scenes footage at the time. It's yeah. not a bad little watch. Uh, but it's got, you don't know how it feels, you wreck me, wildflowers. You wreck me, baby. Yeah, you wreck me in two. But you, know. you don't know how it feels is another one of those songs where you, it's like you really haven't heard in another song that sounds even really remotely like him. Another thing about a song, she said, I know I don't want to waste a line. I want everything to mean something and I want it to be the right line. His stuff, if you go look at it, he's usually very quick to get to a chorus, like four to eight lines. Refugee is, we got something, we both know it. We don't talk too much about it. Ain't no real big secret all the same. Somehow we get around it. And then, boom. It's just like if you, I don't know, kind of a different way of doing it where I, oh, I won't back down, I think it's straight into the chorus. People take a real, real long time. He was pretty, and he didn't have, like we were talking about Led Zeppelin's, all their songs are eight, nine minutes long. Tom Petty's were like three, four minutes yeah. at the most. Just kind of succinct. Had something he wanted to say, and let me get to the point. Let's roll another joint and turn the radio to laugh. Yeah, here's from his, uh, speech. To, it, he was inducted to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. He said everyone was giving these kind of long speeches. His was like two minutes long or something. But it's kind of like the Gettysburg Address. He said if no one ever wrote another song, we'd be fine. You know, There are plenty of songs, but I still do it because I love it. It's a gift. It's not something everyone can do. Well, everyone can do it, but they can't all do it good. When he wrote Wildflowers, here's Here's his uh, quote about it. He says, I just took a deep breath and it came out. The whole song, stream of consciousness, words, music, chords, finished it. I mean, I just played it into a tape recorder and I played the whole song and I never played it again. I actually only spent three and a half minutes on that whole song, so I'd just come back for days playing that tape, thinking there must be something wrong here because this just came too easy. And then I realized there's probably nothing wrong at all. Wow. <laughs> That's yeah. what a... John Fogarty said he wrote Fortunate Son in like 20 minutes. Really? Yeah, that's just how it stayed. But then there was some, I, there was some he would work on for like years. Mary Jane's Last Dance was like that. Here's Free Fall, and he says, Jeff Lynn sat beside me as I wrote that song. Actually, I think Free Fallin' was his line. I think it was the only thing he said. I was just playing on a keyboard, and Jeff was listening to this song, and I played that lick, and he said, Woo, that was good. And I said, really? And he said, yeah. <laughs> and then almost to make Jeff laugh, I ad-libbed the verses, and he's there with his tape recorder recording it. And then I got to the chorus, and I didn't know what to do. And I remember it very well. He said, free-falling. 
And I didn't even know what that meant, but I just sang it. He said, go up, go up, go up an octave. So I went up an octave, and there it was. You know, it was done. He said, uh, too, about Free Fallin', maybe it would be one of my favorites if it hadn't become this huge anthem, but I'm grateful people like it. Uh, but, oh, yeah, here's Mary Jane's Last Dance, like I was saying. That was one I wrote during the Full Moon Fever sessions. I wrote all but the chorus. I just had the loop going around and around and really had most of the words and everything. And I played that tape for Rick Rubin, and he liked it a lot and suggested I write a chorus. So I tried to finish it up while I was making Wildflowers, and there were maybe five years between the writing of the verses and the chorus. I don't think I was writing about pot. I think it was just a girl's name. One other interesting thing I found was his grandpa killed a man. He was married to a Cherokee woman, and they were riding off in a horse and buggy and got stopped by some goon-type fellas on the side of the road, and he ended up killing one of them. Wow. Um, and I guess... Legend says that's how he went, how he got down to Gainesville. They was trying to get away from whoever, but that was kind of a rumor for a while, and then he later admitted it, but he gave it a little nod in his song, Crawling Back to You. It was me and my sidekick. He was drunk and I was sick. We were caught up in a barroom fight till an Indian shot out the light. Um, 1996, he joined back up with the Heartbreakers and had the soundtrack for the movie She's the One, which I've never seen, I don't think, but uh, had Walls was a good song that was on there. And he played background for a Johnny Cash album, Unchained. And his whole band, I guess the whole Heartbreakers did, but um, on that album he covered Southern Accents, and later he would cover I Won't Back Down and did a... Good job. Have you heard that version of it? I think so. Now that you mentioned it. Well, I won't back down. No, I won't back down. You can stand me up at the gates of hell, but I won't back down. He was an old man at the time, but it's pretty yeah. good. I always thought that Tom Petty covered. <laughs> Johnny Cash, just because right. Johnny Cash is older, but you know. so when he was making the, the Wildflowers album, he was in having some marital issues. I guess he's been married for 22 years, and um, after that, he divorced his wife and got addicted to heroin of all drugs. Seems like one you wouldn't probably want to get into, but so he was kind of going through those things. Went back to the studio with Rick Rubin again and produced Echo, an album called Echo in 1999, which. I don't think was probably his best one. I don't know of any songs off of it, but he was still kind of battling the record labels. He offered to put Free Girl Now, which I, well, I guess there's a song off of, off of it that's not terrible, but he offered to give that out as a free MP3 download. Remember MP3s? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I remember my first MP3 player. I thought it was, yeah, it was the coolest it was thing. Awesome. Yeah. It held like 16 songs on it. It's a lot. But, you know, the, yeah. <laughs> It was this little red, uh, little red oval deal, and you couldn't, you had no idea what song was on. So then, early 2000s, he kicked his heroin addiction, got remarried, and in uh, 2002, the Heartbreakers put out the last DJ. Um, and that's kind of the album where he airs a lot of his grievances about the record industry. The last DJ is kind of about that. Uh, like I said earlier, Joe's another one on there that he. I mean, it seems like the, a lot of the album is just kind of about these big shot record guys taking money from the, well, taking money and control, artistic control from the, from the artist. The big girl, they're always the best. You put them on stage and you have them undressed. Some angel whore who can learn a guitar lick. Epstein, you may remember him from earlier, he got a heroin addiction and they kicked him out of the group and he would later overdose and die. Wow. So that's how that ended for him. Lots of dead Epsteins. Ron Blair, the original guy, he rejoined and they put out a... 2006, he put out a solo album called Highway Companion. 
2008 is when he did the halftime show. Okay. Super Bowl. That's when I first remember, like my first introduction to him, I think. Would have been like 2008. I remember my dad was real excited about the <laughs> halftime show. He rarely got excited about a halftime show, but he was excited about that one. So then he put out a live studio album, Mojo. The Heartbreakers did. Not, I don't think it was that good either. So these are starting to dwindle down a little bit. But their final album they put out was Hypnotic Eye, 2014. And probably their worst album they put out. And it was the first one to reach number one on the chart. So that tells you a little bit about the state of music in 2014 versus the latter part of the 70s and 80s. Uh, then he, of course, died in 2017. Cardiac arrest. They later said he had fentanyl, oxycodone, and some other sedative in his system and a lethal amount of it. And I thank this rock and roll for the freedom it's given me. And I thank the fans for such a wonderful life. And I thank God for all of it. God bless you. Thank you. The guy who wrote his autobiography is Warren Zanz. He wrote an article in the Rolling Stone. You'll probably appreciate this, but he would always have coffee. Like he would go interview these guys and he would get coffee beforehand and bring it to the interview. Well, Tom Petty always had coffee sitting there at the table with a couple mugs and some sugar and stuff. So finally he said something to the effect of, Tom, I appreciate you having it this coffee here this is like the best coffee I've ever had what is it he went Tom Petty went on for like 20 minutes talking about describing the perfect cup of coffee and everything well it turns out it was he was at a back in Gainesville he was at some diner and he was drinking coffee and he pulled the waitress aside and said this is the best cup of coffee I've ever had and uh, the waitress took him back behind the kitchen and the, showed him what they're brewing it was Maxwell House <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he, they had uh, whatever the coffee maker was, the, like the industrial size one they were yeah. using in the diner. He bought the exact same one and uh, put it to his house and then only with, only brewed Maxwell House. But then later he, he was at some other diner or some sort of something like that and he had a cup of coffee and he said, this is even better than the coffee <laughs> that I make at home. <laughs> and so he asked and they took him back. They had the same... They had the same uh, coffee maker deal, and it was Maxwell House. <laughs> the the only difference was they were take they had uh, little measuring cups they were using to perfectly measure out the scoops, and they were yeah. like, knifing it off the top. Yeah, he started doing that at this house too. But I just <laughs> thought that was interesting. It was Maxwell House always always good to the last drop or whatever. That's all I got. Good stuff. I think there's enough there. Oh, there's plenty. You know those Spotify raps that come out? Yeah. Every year, my my one, two is either Tom Petty or Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers. But they're both, you know, because there's two different. So it's it'd be Tom Petty 1 and then Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers 2 or Heartbreakers 1 and Tom Petty 2. So it's like, well, I listen to them a lot. I may as well talk about them. Yeah.